Welcome to NTD News. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Here are today's top stories. Former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg delivered a heartfelt message last night, and one that will impact the Democratic presidential race. Things go as expected in South Carolina with Joe Biden winning the state. But can he carry this good fortune into Super Tuesday? The latest polls suggest otherwise. The coronavirus has claimed a second life in the U.S., while the total number of confirmed cases has risen to 89. Cases are popping up in previously untouched states, while one nursing home in Washington is at the center of a mini-outbreak. And the highest award at the Berlin Film Festival goes to There Is No Evil, a dramatic movie with a message. There are costs to both bravery and cowardice. The 2020 presidential campaign starts the week with one less Democratic candidate. Former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg ended his run last night. And then there were six. Pete Buttigieg's run for the White House is over. I am making the difficult decision to suspend my campaign for the presidency. The former mayor's unlikely bid started last year in South Bend, Indiana, with a staff of four. No big email lists, no personal fortune. Hardly anybody knew my name, and even fewer could pronounce it. But that changed over time, and Buttigieg broke barriers, becoming the first openly gay man to collect primary delegates for a major party's presidential nomination. We achieved a top four finish in each of the first four states to hold nominating contests, and we made history winning those Iowa caucuses. Buttigieg didn't endorse a fellow Democratic presidential candidate, but the eventual nominee will likely have his backing. I will do everything in my power to ensure that we have a new Democratic president come January. So what happens now? President Trump taking to Twitter says Buttigieg's exit gives former Vice President Joe Biden a boost. Others agree. I think that the person who benefits the most from Pete Buttigieg being this story is going to be Joe Biden. Frontrunner Bernie Sanders was complimentary to his former competitor. I want to congratulate him for running a brilliant campaign. Former Vice President Joe Biden winning in South Carolina. It's one that he hopes will fuel campaign success in tomorrow's Super Tuesday vote. But recent polls predict Bernie Sanders will hold on to the leading position. We just won and we've won big because of you. Joe Biden notching his first ever nominating contest win in South Carolina, leaving frontrunner Bernie Sanders trailing behind. There are a lot of states in this country, nobody wins them all. I want to congratulate Joe Biden on his victory tonight. The victory breathing life into Biden's campaign after lackluster performances in Iowa, New Hampshire and Nevada, setting the stage for high-stakes showdown on Super Tuesday. 48 percent of South Carolina residents voted for Biden. Senator Bernie Sanders came in a distant second with nearly 20 percent. This adds 33 delegates to Biden for the national convention and 11 to Sanders. Sanders still leads the field in total delegates with 56. Biden is in second place with 48. Biden's campaign had focused on South Carolina with its majority black Democratic electorate. Sanders was leading the national polls before the primary. Voters in 14 states had to cast their votes on March 3rd, Super Tuesday, which may well widen the gap between Sanders and Biden. After spending millions in South Carolina, billionaire Tom Steyer said the voters have spoken and bowed out of the race. Other candidates are already spending time and money in Super Tuesday states, trying to prove to voters their campaigns can last. Polls indicate Bernie Sanders is likely to receive the majority of Democratic delegates in Super Tuesday voting, of some 1,300 available, while Maine opponent Biden has a poll lead in North Carolina. But states with bid delegate counts like California or Texas are expected to fall to Sanders. The polls don't give much hope to the other candidates. Senator Elizabeth Warren trails behind Sanders every time, even in her home state, Massachusetts. Senator Amy Klobuchar is only polling well in her home state, Minnesota. And former New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg looks set to garner some delegates in Virginia, Texas and North Carolina. Tuesday is the first time he's appearing on the ballot. Fans of the president are getting ready for November's election. He addressed thousands at the weekend's conservative political action conference, speaking for almost an hour and a half. President Trump rallied a charged crowd at the Conservative Political Action Conference at the weekend. He spoke of the country's record low unemployment and economic successes. Our economy is roaring. 
Jobs are booming, opportunity is soaring, poverty is plummeting, crime is falling, and America is stronger today than ever before. He said he was able to achieve all this despite the constant cloud of accusations of conspiring with Russia and bribing Ukraine. Both allegations turned out to be unfounded. Sort of a miracle or it's a toughness or it's something. Maybe it's right there, right? Thank you. Thank you, God. The crowd burst into applause when the president announced the Afghan peace deal, which would end the 19-year war. Today, the United States signed a deal with the Taliban so that we can hopefully begin the immediate process of finally bringing our troops back home. Why we originally went there came after September 11th. Way overdue, 19 years as quoted by the president. CPAC's theme this year was America versus socialism. The president warned attendees that socialism would take away their money, choice, and ultimately their freedom. Many speakers and attendees cited the failed socialist experiment in Venezuela, which destroyed the economy and left many starving. We don't need socialism over here. We're doing well. We're actually at an incline right now, and if we brought socialism to our nation, it would turn into Venezuela. In response to the coronavirus outbreak, President Trump announced new travel restrictions on foreign nationals coming from Iran. He also raised a travel advisory for anyone coming from certain parts of South Korea and Italy. The president said he would do everything to stop anyone carrying the infection from entering the country. I think it's a, it's a very good thing to do for the people, to protect us, because America needs protection first. Trump has spoken at the conference every year since becoming president. He quipped that he would be back again next year. Experts gathering at CPAC to discuss China's new weapons of war, taking a closer look at how the Chinese regime is weaponizing big data, AI and 5G to rise to power. At the Conservative Political Action Conference, experts discussing how the Chinese regime uses big data, AI and 5G to try to become the world's leading superpower. The former attorney general saying the regime now uses technology to oppress its own people. It is to use facial recognition software against the Uyghurs. It is to um, use da data analytics against their people to, again, to consolidate their power in a centrally controlled government. Author Gordon Chang saying China will probably not be willing to honor standards set on managing AI because they have already failed to comply with human genetic research standards. Because they haven't been willing to do that, for instance, on genetic research on humans. They have violated all of those standards, and we've got to be very worried what comes out of China. Human Rights Watch reported in 2017 that the Chinese regime was collecting DNA samples from all residents in the Xinjiang region between 12 and 65 years old. And in 2015, a Chinese security bureau in Xinjiang planned to buy U.S. technology to analyze DNA and add that information to a national database. Let's set up a joint venture. A national security expert saying the Chinese regime launders technology from medium and small businesses by setting up joint ventures with them. They set up the joint venture, they get the technology, they duplicate it, they set up a duplicate Chinese company, and they undersell you and you're dead. A Department of Justice report in 2018 states that China was involved in 90 percent of cases of alleged economic espionage and two-thirds of trade secret theft cases from 2011 to 2018. A U.S. representative from Washington saying the U.S. needs to lead in AI and 5G and have allies around the world follow its leadership instead of the aggressive Chinese regime. Be the one that is leading the world. A second person in the U.S. has died from the coronavirus, and the total number of confirmed cases has now reached 89. That includes those confirmed by the CDC and those who local authorities label presumptive cases. A nursing home in Kirkland, Washington, as the center of a mini outbreak. Health officials in Washington state confirmed late Sunday that a nursing home resident died of coronavirus. This is the second U.S. coronavirus death. Both patients were located in the same city, in King County, Washington. Six more confirmed cases are linked to the same nursing home, with over 50 other residents and staff members showing symptoms. On Sunday, Florida declared a public health emergency after two cases of infection cropped up in the Tampa Bay area. And over in Santa Clara County, California, there are three more infected patients. Two are spouses. The third is a person with chronic health issues. Oregon has two new cases, and two more were found in the state of Rhode Island. 
Meanwhile, New York has announced its first case, a female health worker who recently returned from Iran. The U.S. expanded travel restrictions on Iran on Saturday. Already under a travel ban, any foreign national who has visited Iran within the last 14 days cannot enter the U.S. President Trump says he's considering shutting the country's southern border with Mexico to control the spread of the virus. The State Department also raised the travel risk assessment for some parts of Italy and South Korea to level 4, the highest level. Delta Airlines says it's suspending flights to Milan until May, but flights to Rome will continue. And now to China, which just published its first autopsy report of a coronavirus patient. Medical examiners say it's critical for coming up with treatment plans. NTD's Juliet Song reports. China just published the very first autopsy report of a coronavirus patient. And experts find the lungs suffered damage. An expert says autopsy reports are the key to understanding the virus's transmission routes and the way it infects organs so doctors can come up with better clinical treatments. Postmortem examinations found apparent lesions on the lungs, along with large amounts of grayish white slimy liquid. The report says coronavirus pathological features are very similar to those of SARS and MERS. What's different is coronavirus doesn't cause as much thickened or stiff lung tissues, and there's more fluid in the lesions instead. The observation is based on the autopsy of an 85-year-old male. Since he died within 15 days of testing positive for the virus, the researchers said they need more time to study the disease. The report said it is unclear at this stage whether the coronavirus causes damage to the nerve system or other organs. The research is led by a professor from Huazhong University of Science and Technology and is pre-published in China's Journal of Forensic Medicine. Reporting by Juliet Song, NTD News. And in France, the world-famous Louvre Museum closed its doors on Sunday, prompted by the spread of the coronavirus epidemic. Museum officials made the call amid fears that the flow of tourists from around the world could cause contamination. Sunday morning, a short statement from the Louvre announced the museum would close for the morning. A staff meeting about virus prevention efforts was held before the announcement. Later on, they announced the museum would be closed for the day. The shutdown of the world's most popular museum follows the French government's decision on Saturday to ban indoor public gatherings of more than 5,000 people. The Louvre welcomes tens of thousands daily in Paris, and almost three-quarters of its 9.6 million visitors last year visited from abroad. Union official Christian Galani says the Louvre is a confined space that sees a large number of people daily. In these conditions, you can understand the concern of some people and why some demonstrations are canceled. Meanwhile, buildings that people work in are not closed by law, although they are governed by the same closure criteria as other buildings. Louvre staff members expressed concern that they might be in danger of contamination. Likewise, fears are rising after museum workers from northern Italy came to collect works by Leonardo da Vinci that were loaned for a major exhibition. Italy, with over 1,100 coronavirus cases and 29 deaths, has become the epicenter of the outbreak in Europe. Another meeting about virus prevention at the Louvre is scheduled for Monday between union representatives and the museum's management. Stores in Japan are seeing shortages of toilet paper as it sells out in droves amid the spread of the coronavirus. Toilet paper and tissue are nearly out of stock in Japan as residents panic by in anticipation and fear of the coronavirus. Concern is rising that the situation in the country may soon reach its peak. This as the government on Friday closed all schools, from nursery to high school, as the nation prepares for even more virus spread. Following the announcement, locals rushed to nearby stores to stock up on basic necessities, mostly toilet paper and tissue, on top of face masks. Coming up, Israel votes again today for the third time this year. The election will determine whether a victor will emerge or if the country will remain in political deadlock. More on that after the break. Absolutely fantastic. I don't know how you would not enjoy this. It's like a painting coming to life. I laughed, I cried, I I was so touched. The scenes, the sets, the costumes. The dancing, the choreographing, the music, everything was just spectacular. There's no words for it. It's just heavenly. This was the best. 
best ever. The dancers, your mouth is dropped, you're like, wow, this is just beautiful to watch. The technique is flawless, really, it is. The skill and the talent on the stage are jaw-dropping. They perform in perfect unison. They're just stunning. The actual ambiance of the background, there is always the beautiful landscape, and it was so colorful. I find the music amazing. The orchestra, the instruments, it's, it was really brilliant. So moving and so powerful and uplifting. The idea of everybody coming from a celestial place, it's all beauty and truth and light. It's very emotional. It gives me inspiration. True blessing to be here and witness it all. If somebody wants to know about China, there's nothing better than seeing Shen Yun. Shen Yun is definitely something you cannot describe. It's something you have to see to believe. It's a must-see. And I would recommend this to uh, yeah, all my friends. Don't wait. Don't Get your tickets wait. now. Israelis vote for the third time in a year to determine if Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu remains in power. The Prime Minister's future is already uncertain because of corruption charges. Israel votes Monday to elect a leader for the third time in a year. The two previous elections proved inconclusive, allowing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud party to continue to hold power. Netanyahu seeks to remain the country's prime minister in the midst of corruption charges. Still, another inconclusive election is predicted. Netanyahu and his rival, former military chief Benny Gantz, toured the country in a last-minute effort for votes. All we need to do is take all the neighbors. Hey, policeman, did you vote already? Well done, at 7.01. I'm not allowed to ask him who he voted for, but I can guess. Polling stations across the country opened at 7 a.m. local time, and Israelis have until 10 p.m. to cast their vote. Media outlets can then start to signal whether the deadlock is finally broken. Gantz expressed hope for a peaceful election. I expect no one to, uh, to practice any kind of violence, whether it's by words or whether it's by deeds. And let us all respect the democracy aspect of this day. Israel has made it easy for those quarantined because of the coronavirus to vote. Instead of normal polling stations, the quarantined voters cast ballots in 15 specially insulated tents. Israel has a dozen confirmed cases. Turkey shot down two Syrian warplanes over Idlib yesterday and struck a military airport well beyond its front lines in a sharp escalation of its military operations following the death of dozens of Turkish soldiers last week. Turkey destroyed Syrian army air defense systems, wiped out more than 100 tanks and downed two planes, the country said on Sunday. The attack was their response to last week's airstrike that killed 33 Turkish soldiers. Tensions in Syria have escalated between the Turkey-backed rebels and Russian-backed Syrian government forces in the country's northwest Idlib province. Increasing fears that the two regional powers will be brought into direct confrontation. Turkey's defense minister said they have no intention of facing Russia, but dubbed the mission a success. As you know, the Operation Spring Shield that was launched following the atrocious attack on February the 27th continues with success. Diplomatic efforts by Ankara and Moscow to defuse tensions have fallen short so far and hopes of a ceasefire in Syria's last major rebel stronghold after nine years of war are slowly fading. Interfax news agency reported on Sunday that the Kremlin hopes Presidents Putin and Erdogan will agree to hold talks in Moscow later this week. Up next, North Korea is once again stretching its military muscles after a months-long hiatus in weapons testing. Learn more about today's launch of two presumed short-range ballistic missiles after the break. have described China Uncensored like the Daily Show, but about China. In China, something can be illegal, but still in common practice. For example, 
bribery or intellectual property theft or Uber. Well, at the beginning, I was super excited when I got 500 views and now the show's grown to about half a million subscribers on YouTube. One episode reached 7.9 million people and counting. I'm a little freaked out that that many people have seen my face. Hey, have you heard of China Uncensored? It's starring me. It's more and more obvious that China is having a major influence on the U.S. Hey, have you heard of China Uncensored? Zhongguo Jamie. In five years, I see China Uncensored as the only show on TV or the internet. It will be the sole source of edutainment worldwide. Have you heard of China Uncensored? Yeah, I actually, I have, you actually I have? have? He's heard of China Hello. Uncensored. I love uh. China Uncensored. Are you tired of newspapers spinning the truth and pushing false narratives? And are you looking for honest coverage of Spygate, the true story of collusion? Or the truth behind the crisis at our southern border? Or how the Chinese Communist Party is working to subvert America and our way of life? Then you need to check out The Epic Times newspaper. It's independent, nonpartisan, and it doesn't push any political agendas. Just go to readepic.com and try it yourself for a full month for just a single dollar. You'll absolutely love it. North Korea fired two presumed short-range ballistic missiles into its eastern sea today. This is the first time after a months-long hiatus in weapons demonstrations. Two missiles were launched from the eastern coastal city of Wonsan in North Korea and flew almost 150 miles, reaching 22 miles in altitude. The launches came two days after North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un supervised an artillery drill on Friday, aimed at testing the combat readiness of units in frontline and eastern areas. The Japanese chief cabinet secretary responded to the missile launch. Immediately after launch by North Korea, the Japanese government has contacted the United States and South Korea to confirm close coordination and is making every effort to collect and analyze information. Regarding this launch, it is necessary to conduct a comprehensive and specialized analysis based on the required information. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said North Korea's months-long hiatus in weapons demonstrations may have been forced by the coronavirus crisis in the country. A film that shows there are costs to both bravery and cowardice won the top award at the Berlin Film Festival. Its Iranian director was unable to receive the award as he is banned from leaving his country. NTD's Germany correspondent Christian Watchin has the details. The movie There Is No Evil won the highest award at the Berlin Film Festival, The Golden Bear. The Iranian film explores the moral dilemmas thrust on those chosen to carry out executions. A film that asks questions about our own responsibility and choices we all make in life. The Golden Bear for best film goes to Mohamed Rusulov. The director was banned from leaving the country because of propaganda charges he faces in relation to earlier films. His daughter, who stars in the film, picked up the award on his behalf. Obviously, I'm very, very overwhelmed and happy about this award. And at the same time, I'm very sad because this is for a filmmaker who couldn't be here tonight. During the press conference following the ceremony, the director joined via video call. The film was shot in secret, mostly at night or in rural locations, to avoid catching the authorities' attention. It carried risks for cast and crew. I would like to thank our amazing cast and crew who put their lives in danger to be on this film. This year, the festival showed 340 films produced in over 70 countries. The international jury spread the prizes with no film nor country dominating the awards. Two U.S. productions received top awards. Reporting by Christian Watchin, NTD News, Berlin. Coming up, a U.K. artist whose paintings vanish within the pages of gilded books. Learn more about this disappearing art form and one of its last remaining artists when we return.
Our investigative reporters at the Epoch Times have spent 18 months uncovering the biggest political scandal in modern history. We connected the dots around Spygate, the actions by Obama-era officials against Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Join me on Declassified as we bring you up-to-date developments on this unfolding scandal. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fight it out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. Moving to the UK, an artist whose paintings vanish within the pages of gilded books. Our UK correspondent, Jane Wirrell, met with one of the world's last remaining four edge painters. And when you release it, come. Forage painting is where a painting is applied onto a book in such a way that you can't see it. He's pretty certain he's the only forage painter who's still doing it for a living. You see it, you don't see it. The secret behind the magic is watercolour paints, without much water or paint and a lot of concentration. It's not rocket science but you've got to have the right mentality to be able to uh, knuckle down and be patient with it. You learn by doing it, like so much in life. He's been a forage painter for over 40 years and has worked on many English classics, like this book that hides a portrait of Jane Austen. And this is hidden under gold, which is the traditional barrier. Of course, modern books don't come with gilded edges, so I am going back to the, I'm going back to the origins here. The demand for it was originally driven only by the British gentry in the 18th century, but for us in more recent times, the US has been that main market, which peaked during the 60s, 70s and 80s. They fit the ticket as a, as a choice example of something that's quintessentially English. The artwork also comes in different variations, like this special double. And then, finally it up gives us the view of Regent Street. But because a leaf of a, of a book has got two faces, you can turn it over and produce a completely different painting on the other side. In this case, Hampton Court. Frost says he wants to train more people so this magical vanishing art form doesn't disappear. Jane Wirral, NTG News in the UK. And that's all for now. Thanks for tuning in. Join us again tonight. I'm Tiffany Meyer.